and my personal feeling is that the main public health benefit of psilocybin will be addiction treatment. The public health burden of that, the patients, their families, innocent people who get killed in wrong way drunk drivers, it's just, you know, way over the top. And so psilocybin has so much potential. I mean, if we have a good treatment for addiction that's lasting, I mean, that's, that's changing healthcare. Well, welcome, George, to the MAPS Canada podcast. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Glad to be and here, Luke. Yeah. yeah, it's a busy conference. We're here at Psychedelic Science 2023, the world's biggest ever conference on psychedelics. Yeah. 12,000 attendees, and there's amazing heavy hitters in the space. George is one of those who, and so thank you for taking some time mm -hmm. for us. Dr. George Greer is the president and co-founder of the Hefter Research Institute. Mm -hmm. And since the founding in 1993, Hefter affiliated researchers account for 63% of top cited articles on classic psychedelics, which yeah. is a crazy statistic yeah. um, and is amazing. And you yourself, Dr. Greer have conducted over 100 therapeutic ses sessions with MDMA between 1980 and 1985 before it was made a Schedule One drug in 1986, which people of my age, my generation might not remember that yeah. <laughs> because we weren't alive. It's actually, 85 is when it was controlled. That's when we stopped. Oh, yeah. God, 85. DEA, that right, 85 right. for here. Yeah. Or you would have used that last year for sure as an opportunity to research if you could, yeah, I'm that's sure. Right. <laughs> so um, as the kids would say, you're a veritable OG in the psychedelic space. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's start chatting about uh, Hefter. Why uh, why did uh, Hefter begin, and uh, what sparked it? Yeah. So what sparked it is uh, going back when I was doing the MDMA work in the early '80s before it was illegal. Uh, my last patient uh, had myeloma, bone pain from cancer. And couldn't function and had this amazing experience where he re-anchored his visualization, pain-free, ecstatic. And, and that, that worked for him for weeks, you know, several weeks. And then, then he did a couple more sort of sessions later. And th then he passed away after that. You know, this is like, you know, 85, 86. Um, and then maybe three or four years later, and I had asked FDA for compassionate use to continue with this one patient. Right. With the MDMA I had, which is nothing, not FDA approved or anything. I made it in Sasha Shulkin's lab. So out of the blue, uh, FDA had been saying no to all psychedelic research for decades before then. But they reorganized, and a new director had taken over, Curtis Wright, and he just called me up out of the blue, and he said, are you uh, still interested in giving MDMA to your patient? <laughs> it's like... Uh, well, he passed away from his cancer, but I would have, and, he, and he, we talked, he said, so we're changed, reorganized, and I'm Curtis Wright, and, and we want to just study psychedelic drugs like any other drugs. No, nothing pro against, just mainstream. I went, wow. So that was big news, you know, which I shared in Rick Sprost, was a good friend of mine, and so we he heard about that. And, and so, what year was that, that you had that call? Uh, late 80s. I don't remember exactly, you know. Wow. Um, and then, so Rick uh, at University of New Mexico uh, applied to FDA to study DMT and got permission. So he was the first U.S. researcher to be mm. approved by FDA to do psychedelic research in decades. Right. It was amazing. And for, for viewers, that's Rick Strassman. Rick Strassman, the, yeah. The, he was a professor at University of New Mexico and still right. is in New Mexico. Yeah. And DMT, the spirit molecule, that's the, the book? He wrote that book, yes. Okay. Correct. Uh -huh. Yeah. Awesome. So soon after that, in 1993, Dave Nichols, a chemist, Purdue University, invented lots of LSD analogs funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, you know, for decades, you know, animal stuff. Uh, he was saying, I've got to, now that FDA is open, you know, we don't have any money, I have to start a, 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 a institute to do this research, you know, and so he said, if I don't do that, I'm going to kick myself. <laughs> so he founded Hefter, invited a bunch of us to join. Um, and uh, so that was what led up to, like, why now? FDA is doors open. All we, need, all we need is money, you know, but we can get permission to do it. And uh, FDA has been open ever since. And so that was the initial initial thing. And I, they were started, started to do some legal stuff in New Mexico. So I would sort of have been running the institute, you know, the day-to-day -day operations for 30 years. Uh, wow. This September will be our 30th anniversary. 
thank you for being on the front line. You're welcome. I hope yeah. people have told you that over the years. Hey, yes. it's been very exciting. <laughs> Yeah, 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 amazing. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, what are what are you most proud of in your um, your 30 years with Hefter Institute, and maybe also the accomplishments of yeah. Hefter itself? Well, I think the most to date, the most impactful uh, studies we funded uh, for society science were the two uh, studies on patients with cancer who had anxiety or depression. And those are done at New York University right. and Johns Hopkins. That's the Roland Griffith one. Roland Griffiths and then Steve Ross at, right. at NYU. And it um, took a long time. Recruiting was hard. But when they were published at the same issue late uh, 2016, um, huge. The media just increased. And, and uh, Michael Pollan's book you know, came out soon right. after that. And then that book really just changed the whole media world about psychedelics and it just you know, skyrocketed after that book. That was a real watershed event in, in yeah. the PR and public knowledge of all that. He was so, you know, so positive about that. How, yeah. uh, how to change your mind or something. Change, yeah. yeah, how, how to, to yeah. change your mind. Yeah. How to and change then, your mind. Then the Netflix series came out and yes. Michael yeah. Pollan's getting sort of swarmed here at the conference. Yeah, when yeah. He's around. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and so, and then the public became interested. Scientists became interested. All these for-profit companies, you know, sprang up. And since then, and so that that's been the most impactful uh, study. But the study, from a science perspective, that I'm I think we're most proud of was our largest, most expensive study. Uh, you know, a couple of million dollars or more. It was Michael Bogan shoots at New York University, uh, addiction specialist. Uh, published in November, a uh, study with psilocybin for alcohol use disorder. Mm. And uh, really good results. And my personal feeling is that the main public health benefit of psilocybin will be addiction treatment. Mm. Because especially alcoholism, addiction, it's like the public health burden of that, the patients, their families, innocent people who get killed in wrong way drunk drivers. It's just you know, way over the top. And so psilocybin has so much potential because we've uh, funded studies still ongoing for smoking cessation, cocaine addiction, opioid addiction. So that is, I mean, if we have a good treatment for addiction that's lasting, I mean, that's, that's changing healthcare yeah. in this country and it, you know, anywhere he wants to do that. So that's really exciting to me. Wow. And most proud of that one, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, um, and uh, and we, we always forget that behind every PTSD statistic, there's always you know three x four x multiplier: the children, the relatives, the yeah. siblings, the parents of those people who have to who who are you know secondarily traumatized. Absolutely, by these issues, so. absolutely. Having an addicted alcoholic parent is like they're absent. You know, they can't connect with you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What research would you like to see, say, in the next 10 years in the psychedelic space? Yeah. Well, Hefter has funded pilot studies and the major indications for psilocybin, you know, addiction, anxiety, depression, you know, cancer distress, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so the next phase for all that, and that's, those are all big, important health problems. Uh, it's time for the uh, National Institutes of Health. To, to take up because they have huge budgets, you know, can do to really take it mainstream science budgets yeah. and, and big studies. But there is a, uh, a funding gap between uh, a researcher getting their PhD and getting the experience and data collected from doing little pilot research projects to even qualify to get an NIH grant. You right. know, anybody can apply, but there, 15 to 20 percent applications are accepted. So. At this point, our focus is helping you get funding for these young, new researchers mm. to get their start because, you know, there's things like the Alzheimer Foundation. They fund these people for Alzheimer's, you know, or rheumatology, found all these foundations, specialty, they get a lot of money from the patients. It's nothing like that for psychedelics. I mean, there's, right. there's Hefter, but we, you don't have this giant, you know, outreach and right. stuff. So that's, so we want to support them, and my feeling is that you know, we need to 
you know, bigger clinical trials to really nail down things. Uh, and here at this meeting, we had a, a, a meeting with uh, Josh Gordon, who's the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. He came here, it was very friendly, very positive. He's, you know, he's got his restrictions. But right. he also said, yeah, like philanthropists, how can we help? We need more researchers who can get our grants. You know, we right. like to give them, but we need to do that. So that was a, a message. And at this point, it, it doesn't matter to me what they study so much because research needs to go on continuously yeah. to discover things that we haven't imagined now. No one's imagined. And, and these just novel discoveries like Chuck Nichols, Dave's son, uh, he's at LSU. Uh, his lab discovered microdoses of certain psychedelics just block inflammation in the body, like in your alveoli and arteries. You think of all the diseases that are inflammatory, chronic inflammation, it's like mm. way bigger than mental health, you know. Yeah. And so just chance discovery, you know, it's like, so what else can be discovered? And then research about, well, Josh Gordon mentioned this actually. We wanted, NIDA, NIMH wants to support research different psychotherapy methods, you know, different types of psychotherapy, mm. uh, integration, all those things which have not been studied. Uh, blinding, you know, you can't really blind psilocybin, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so these, all these sort of fine tunings to improve the treatments, you know, make them more efficient so they're more affordable for people, people have more access. And he, it, and Dr. Gordon really stressed the need for access from marginalized minority people, you know, who don't have the money or support and really, and really need help. You know, they're suffering from a lot of mental illness. So that's a, a concern of, 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 of his. So that was really good to hear, you know, diversity, that, that thing. So those are the, the things we'd like to study. And then the other is just still, we've done a lot of this, but what are the mechanisms of actions? What are psychedelics doing in the brain? And yeah. it's so complicated. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you talk to Chuck Nichols, like the 5-HT2 serotonin 2A receptor where the psychedelic action, it's really complicated. And yeah. what happens after it hits that receptor, depending on which <laughs> drug, it moves this way and that happens this way, this happens through the body, a huge network. It's extremely complex. and. Tons more to be discovered about that. We've just yeah. barely opened the door. So basic science and psychotherapy studies, those are the things that we've imagined now. Got it. And yeah, that's the, the funny thing that many people might not realize is that neuroscience hits that 5-HD2A receptor and then we don't know. <laughs> and there's a big gap there. And then uh, it can go lots of places, places yeah. we don't even know where yeah. it goes. Yeah, who knows. Yeah. And they, they also act on like other receptors and you know there's a oh, compounding yeah. and then yeah. you know I forget the word but the um, the community effect or something about taking like a natural mushroom versus a synthesizer oh there's something like, called a, an entourage effect and yeah entourage effect yeah, entourage right, yeah. and, and so what's that about I don't know that any sort of pure scientific research has been done on that it's like a lot of money and not a lot of people are interested in that but that needs money, you know, to do yeah. that. Research is expensive. Each for each participant or subject in the research studies, the clinical trials, the cost per participant is like can be twenty thousand dollars per participant. So if you have twenty thousand dollars in your pocket right now, donate to Maps Canada below, <laughs> yeah. and that'll contribute towards one person. One person. <laughs> one person. Yeah, and it's getting the, help. The Bogatu <laughs> study was actually thirty thousand because they offered. Two sessions in a third session, so the you know, three sessions, so they, yeah. that adds up. Yeah. And the MAPS has three sessions of um, MDMA, MDMA as well, exactly. so it raises the price, right? Absolutely. Um, and then the follow up and the therapist calls for that. Oh, yeah, all, all the hours that. of therapy, all that. Yeah. And all the recording of data and recruiting. Recruiting is a huge challenge in research. You have, may have yeah. to recruit 10 people to get one person who qualifies for everything and is willing. So yeah. that's a lot of work just to get people in the door. Yeah, and, and we saw at the, the John Hopkins NYU study on the religious clergy that they had spent two years alone on the analysis of the data, right? And that's, you know, students who need to be paid or team members that need to be paid going over data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to make sure they get it right. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. It's expensive, but hey, look where we've come, right? You know, expensive, but in another way, priceless. I mean, what, once a scientific research report is published publicly, is on... Uh, PubMed, you know, Institute of uh, Medicine uh, Library. 
it's a it's a permanent record as long as civilization lasts. It's permanently available online to everybody who can get on the internet. Yeah. So it's it's a permanent record. So it's an investment in indefinite future. So that's that's huge. So know. cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay, I've I have an interesting question for you. Okay. So MDMA seems to be a very unique substance. Yes. Um, and here at the conference earlier, there was a psychedelics fundamental workshop, and at that workshop, they categorized different psychedelics: um, the phenethylamines, mm -hmm. phenethylamines, yeah. the tryptamines, as well as dissociatives. And they put MDMA on a separate slide. <laughs> that's that's right, um, yeah. Which is interesting. And so um, I'm curious in your experience being a uh, long or old school, let's say, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> MDMA. Um, uh, person that um, how was MDMA a psychedelic and how does that tie into its therapeutic use? Hey, we hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. Now, if you want to support and become part of the psychedelic movement, feel free to donate to MAPS Canada at the link in the description below. Thank you for helping our mission to support equitable access to legal and regulated psychedelic medicines for all Canadians. Well, technically, I would agree that MDMA is not a classic psychedelic, you know, LSD, it, it doesn't. It's not an agonist. It doesn't hit the 2A receptor. Oh, what does agonist mean? Agonist is a drug that uh, hits a receptor and, and says, tells it, do your thing. You know, turns it on, uh, activates it. It's not an inhibitor. You know, it's an activator of that receptor. Um, and uh, it releases serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine in the whole brain, you know, a lot of places. So, but still, things get activated, and we had uh, some rare, but some participants had, I remember one woman in particular with MDMA, she like, it was like LSD, she, in, in her inner experience, she was totally quiet. She said she relived the evolution of life on Earth. Wow. <laughs> you know, and that was totally real. That was her universe she was in, and she was really quiet. Yeah. It was like, up to humans, like, that was MDMA? <laughs> so can happen more with high doses, right. but uh, really uncanny. But for most people, uh, some people called it empathogen, but Nave Nichols uh, invented the term intactogen, and he right. published on this in, about the separate category because right. it does some things that, say, stimulants do and some things that classic psychedelics do, but it's t very unique. And, and so MDMA is, we don't know other drugs like that, you know, there may be analogs, but... but MDA? <laughs> MDA would be in a similar ballpark, though MDMA is really closer to psychedelics. It's more, it can be more psychedelic than MDMA. Right. And we can come back to the definition of psych psychedelic mind manifesting. Exactly. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. In, I mean, in my personal experience, I've found um, <laughs> that it's sort of like psychedelics is sort of like a really strong... Non-specific amplifier to use the term from Stan Groff. Yes. Well, MDMA it seems to be like you relax and kind of sink deeper into your conscious, but you need to have that willingness and you know to go deeper. It won't kind of just put it in your face. Yeah, it doesn't you shove it. you into something so much. Uh, yeah. But and so the phrase we came up with when we were using it was MDMA uh, blocks the uh, um, uh, fear response to an emotional threat. Right any emotional threat, inside, outside. And, uh, and I've talked to Michael Mithofer about that. He's done most of the clinical investigator, you know, director for MAPS research. He's an amazing physician. And he said in, in his PTSD work, which I never did with, with MDMA, it sort of has a balance of like stimulation, energy, you know, to help motivate the patient to face these things mm. and and the fear reduction in the amygdala to reduce their defenses and make it less fear when they're when they're re-experiencing these horrible traumatic memories from sexual trauma or combat etc so he just it's, it's just that great balance that really fits these needs of these patients so that's a really fortunate thing about that Right. I never thought about how the stimulating effect could be part of that <clears throat> therapeutic thing, sort of the motivation to go yeah, into it. Yeah. So that, it takes that combination is cool. Yeah, energy to face things you're afraid of. Like, yeah, yeah okay, I'll, I'd better think about this over here. You know, and it's <laughs> like, well, oh, well, this is easy and it's coming up and it's intense and you breathe, and, but you have, you know, your therapist supporting you and 
and they go through it and they then obviously they recover you know right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and you can see the results and you can see the results. how effective it is um, and continues to be effective at, even after the whole oh. trial is done yeah is I've met people said like I had this <laughs> years ago in a MAPS trial and I just don't have PTSD anymore I haven't wow. had it since then it's like you know severe combat it's like happy person yeah I mean unprecedented yeah yeah wow yeah um, oh, and I'm curious, so um, there's a certain molecule that has uh, been discussed in psychedelic circles, sort of as, and often compared with MDMA, okay. uh, 3-MMC. I'm, I may, might have heard it, I'm not familiar with that or what people reported about it, etc. Oh, and, and curious, um, when you mentioned um, that uh, someone had a very LSD-like experience on MDMA, yeah. uh, and you mentioned it was sort of a higher dose, so what was the dose? No, no, no. She did not have a higher dose. Oh. That's what's amazing about oh. it. I mean, I've just heard anecdotally people taking like 200 milligrams or, you know, high doses yeah. can get more trippy, you know, more sort of like a psychedelic. But right. no, she had probably gave her like 150 or something, you know, 50 booster. Yeah. And that was just her experience. Wow. Yeah. Everybody, everybody is unique. <laughs> and we were just speaking with, with Don Latin here just like an hour ago, <laughs> and he was sharing that. Uh, some of his ketamine, personal ketamine therapeutic journeys, he'll have the same dose, same time of day, same playlist for the music, same setting. Okay. Sometimes it, there's very little effect. Sometimes it's highly therapeutic type experience, uh -huh. and sometimes full-blown mystical. Yeah. And there's a mystery to that. Yeah, you know, I mean, so. <laughs> you know, we, we're not static machines. We're changing all the time. You know, mm. every human is changing all the time. So, like... The timing, the dose, what's going on with you, all these things affect the experience and, and a lot of that we just don't understand or can't predict. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So let's uh, return to that question. Okay. So back in the day, early 1980s, huh? MDMA is not scheduled, you right. know, the, the good old days. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, that you were doing uh, studies into MDMA and came across a new discovery about MDMA for, for couples. And yeah. It seems obvious to us now, but, you know, back in the day. Yeah, so known. let me just give you a little bit of background on that. I, I, I discovered a, a legal way I could manufacture MDMA, which I did in Sasha Silken's lab. We did it together. But I could say I made it, and according to the California Attorney General, where I lived at the time, I could take the drug I made and give it to my patients without any drug companies or FDA or anything. So I started doing that, and we just, through word of mouth, just, you know, word spread that we were offering these sessions, and so people came, most individuals, but several couples, I mean, you know, uh, I think like 19 patients, but maybe six couples in that first thing that we reported in, in mm. an article. And, and, uh, my wife and I had experienced this when we had our first experience. It's just easier to talk about difficult issues, you know, and it's like, well, I, I don't want to like upset them, you know, or I'm, I'm afraid to say this. It's like, eh, just kind of nervous about it. It's like, none of that. Mm. You just like, oh, we can talk and like, oh, well, I didn't like this. You know, it's like, oh, okay. And what, were you unhappy with me with this? It's like, actually, I was unhappy with you about this. You know, it's like, Okay, all forgiven. You know, it was like, wow. And so of the couples we have it to, virtually all of them reported the same thing, that their intimate emotional communication with their partner was much more direct, to the point, fluid. And the surprising thing was they said, ever since then, that ability, that skill to communicate that way persisted. Mm. And the longest follow we have was two years later. And this couple said, yeah, we've learned a new way to communicate in our relationship, and it's, it seems permanent, you know. So that was a surprise to us. And so we reported that. But our study was not for couples, for couples therapy. These were people who had no significant mental illness because it was just too risky. And, you know, the worried well, I mean, people people like us, you know. Oh, what does worried well mean? By worried well means a person who doesn't have a diagnosis of a mental disorder, but they worry and they're not just mm. happy all the time, which, which is like 
pretty much everyone without a mental disorder, you know, right. has, <laughs> has worry. Has some level of worry. Absolutely. Unless they're perfectly enlightened and, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but I think fear. even the Dalai Lama has worries. <laughs> so uh, he, he might not be perfectly enlightened then. Hey. Maybe not. But if he's not, who is, you right. know. But, uh, yeah, so, so it's that kind of people. But everybody has issues and, the, and it, everybody was really helped with their things they were struggling with, you know, personal growth issues, relationship issues, whatever. You know, and so so that was the sort of the couple story that came out of that, and that was a yeah a new something new. But you know this article we got published, there really never had been an article about MDMA used in a therapeutic context before. So it was the first one about MDMA in a therapeutic setting, you know, with a group of people. So that was an important landmark that we're very proud of. I guess I can personally speak. Okay, yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> the power of, of MDMA for, for in, in the context of a couple is, is very powerful. Oh, and actually one of the warnings I've learned in the MDMA uh, uh, clinical setting for MAPS for patients is a, a lot of things, including you may fall in love with your therapist. <laughs> well, and to be mindful of that, and therapists are have, there's a lot of like precautions and ethics and yes, and, oh yeah, and care. No, I hear that, I hear so. that from my researchers with psilocybin also. You know, oh, really? it's like oh yeah, hmm. you know, people fall in love with us. It's like okay, we gotta really be careful with that. But I, you know, I met people just friends. It's like you know they took him to May, they fell in love, and but their relationships basically only worked when they were on MDMA. The rest of the time is like classic, just relationship conflict. It's like, it was not gonna work in regular life. Yeah. So that's a risk, you get, you know, you fall in love, you get involved and, and you get to know them in, in regular life and it's like, it's not really working, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's yeah. something people need to know about. Yeah. It's not yeah. a magic bullet to be live happily ever after with your partner at the time. For sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the the way I, I, I've thought about it, because I was in a relationship that was catalyzed partly through through MDMA. Uh -huh. um, and my experience was, when in, under the experience of MDMA, and you know, this isn't the scientific perspective, yeah. it's, you know, the, the heart, the way they describe it as a heart opener, yeah. intactogen. Um, it's like, that's how you would be if you were super far down the path of spiritual growth, just right. enjoy. And if you're in that state, you're very forgiving for people and you can, you know, have that kind of bond and connection with, with almost anyone potentially or, or everyone. Yeah. Right? And then when you, so that it's almost like a preview of where you could get to if you're willing to do the work and stick with it long enough. Yeah. You know? But it doesn't necessarily address the, it doesn't address the practical things of someone being in a, moving to a different country the next day or, you know, more granular aspects of someone's personality or the way they want to live their life in particular. And maybe that love could carry on even after splitting up or something. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship is. Uh, no, I've, I've heard of relationships of breaking up. I don't like the way you roll up the toothpaste. <laughs> I mean, little things like that. It's like one of my favorite sayings is I'm never upset for the reason I think. Yeah. It's not about the toothpaste. Yeah. It's yeah. something else that you're not in touch with. Yeah. Maybe that couple could benefit from some kind of, you know. Yeah. And some therapy. <laughs> hey, you know, maybe yeah. look at some uh, deeper issues here, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be MDMA, you know. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, it's been, there's, uh, there's this idea of um, uh, my family all getting together and having a family MDMA ceremony. That's okay. a little experiment. But really, that's really, the first thing is to have family dinners. Like, you don't need to come into... <laughs> they show up, yeah, here, here, swallow this. Right, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to jump into the extremely powerful, intense, you know, you know risky too, um, yeah. you know, modality. So, you know, couples yeah. therapy could be the first thing. You know, I don't know if you want to do that on your first date, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean... Like a couple's therapy, not, not that you're you kind of on your own, you know, <laughs> it's a free country and you have the consequences of whatever might happen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah, free, it was free back then at least. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> so, um, going back to that, that window of time when MDMA was legal mm -hmm. and, or just not scheduled at all. And yeah. then became scheduled in 1985. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are some people, including Rick Doblin, president, founder of MAPS, organizers at this conference mm -hmm. who, uh, were, uh, talking to petitioning the DEA to not schedule it and Correct. you were part of that exactly um, uh, I'm curious if you could share the sort of story of how that unfolded and what went down yeah so uh, yeah it was a big process it went on for a while starting in 84 that process in 85 there were some hearings uh, you know after it was scheduled and stuff so uh, 
for Schedule I in, in this law, the, the statute, you know, uh, to be Schedule I, a drug cannot have, quote, accepted medical use in the United States. That's the wording of the law. Uh, DEA has the authority to interpret that law, to define mm -hmm. accepted medical use. Okay. So at the time of the hearings, I was the only person in the country doing it totally above board. I had my source I'd made myself. It was all open, legal. People could talk about it. And I had a peer review committee of psychiatrists, you know, who said, yes, you can do this, informed consent. You know, there's some scientific literature, a little tiny bit from Sasha and, and Dave Nichols. Uh, so we interpreted that, and most people like, well, this drug does not have, it's not that addictive. It, does, it just doesn't meet that level. And so a lot of hearings and blah, blah, blah. And then the, the administrative law judge assigned to the DEA issued his opinion, this drug should be in Schedule 3, which is what we asked for. Mm. But Schedule 1, it's hard to research, it's so many restrictions, it really just slows down everything. And, uh, but the DEA said, okay, yes, thank you for your opinion. We disagree. We're going to put it in Schedule 1. Right. Dr. Lester Grinspoon in Harvard, who was a big psychedelic advocate at that time, uh, appealed to the Boston Circuit Court of Appeals, he appealed this decision to a, a court. And the court found in his favor. Like, yeah, you're right. So he, he the court negated the DEA's put in Schedule 1 for like a month. Mm. During that month, the DEA said, okay, we've reconsidered accepted medical use, and we have decided that accepted medical use equals FDA approval of the drug. <laughs> because they had the authority to do that. that. That was their policy. And so, <laughs> and the judge said, that's your authority to have your criteria. So mm. back into Schedule 1. Oh, so they tightened the, okay. And, and they have the authority to do that. Yeah. yeah so that's yeah. just, you know, that's just what happened. And right. I mean, was I surprised? I was surprised the first judge said Schedule 3. It's like, I knew it was going down. Parties in New York, out there in Texas, it was crazy. You know, so we knew it was inevitable, but we, you know, it was a good fight, and we got all this info out there that you know, and the hearings and stuff, and all right. that. So, so that's that was the nutshell of the story. Yeah, and Rick Rick Doblin uh, really organized a lot of those, a lot of that. He did a lot of work on those hearings and witnesses and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's like the the it's you know, it's like the the hero's origin story, right? It's like yeah, exactly. That man losing his parents, the, tra the original tragedy, right? Maybe the they that needed to happen to have yeah. this, you know. Yeah, and so that got you know publicity. So that was that was that's what happened there. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I was born ten years later. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you have more hair than me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I might be heading that direction. Too. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, so. Um, uh, I, I've had the fortune, I have my own YouTube channel on top of the Maps Canada YouTube okay. channel, and I've spoken with many friends of mine who are totally psychedelically unaware. Okay, and all uh, right. they ask some interesting questions that I wouldn't necessarily have thought. Sure. Um, including just phrase like this, is their, their honest question is, are psychedelics addictive? I'm curious on your thoughts. The simple answer is no. Mm. That being said, television is addictive. <laughs> Video games are addictive, you know, sex is addictive, food is addictive, gambling is addictive. So there are a lot of things that are addictive, you know, like a compulsive behavior the person has, does not have control over that is, worsens their functioning, you know, in life. And so uh, people can definitely be psychologically, I think a better term is habituated, you know, because addiction usually means if you stop the drug, you have withdrawal symptoms. It right. doesn't happen with psychedelics or MDMA. Um, other things can happen, but you know, a lot of people compulsively take anything, mushrooms, acid, you know, every week or whatever, and they're not getting much out of it, you know, um, but they just feel, oh, I, I feel bad, I just need to get in that space again, you know, because MDMA is happy and my life is not, I just, I just need to get there now, you know, it's that sort of addiction circuitry in their brain, I think, is activated. It's this compulsion mm -hmm. to 
relief from your pain, emotional pain. So in, in that sense, they, I would say habit forming, you know, and, and it can be unhealthy mm. use that can have health consequences, you know, psychological consequences. So, but physical addiction, no. And, and that's totally accepted in, in the scientific community. These really? drugs are not, not addictive drugs. Are uh, maybe speci- talking about MDMA specifically, are, are, are there, aren't there withdrawal symptoms to MDMA? Like the, the depletion of serotonin? That's and, not withdrawal. That's the, that's after, after a single dose, people have that, you know, a day or two later, just kind of a dip in energy, maybe mood, a little more depression, anxiety, you know, muscle tension from the right. jaw and stuff. <laughs> so that's pretty normal for MDMA to have some sort of a, a, a down, you know, sometimes it's like a crash, oh my oh, God. withdrawal is when you've continuously taken a substance yeah, over time you're, you're taking and it then like, you get off of it. You're like you're taking heroin every day and you stop it, you have opioid withdrawal, which is really painful. It's not dangerous, but it's really painful. That's like right. physical withdrawal, physical symptoms oh, of withdrawal. And, oh, and, and then, so I guess the difference is that with MDMA, with withdrawal, you need the substance to deal with the withdrawal. Exactly. But you can't, you aren't undepleted by taking more MDMA. Like exactly. It would yeah. just deplete you. Yeah. Well, you if, might not feel any. If, if you took MDMA, like, you know, I've seen people have done it. I don't have it. Don't need one like this. some people have taken it like every day, you know. But after a few days, they're just depleted more and more and more. But every time you take it, it's going to release what's there, and you'll have some effect. But it's going to diminish, yeah. you know. Not with time. recommended. Not <laughs> definitely not recommended. Strong disclaimer. Do, yeah, do not do not take MDMA a lot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, what does a lot mean? That's a good question. I would <laughs> say, range, so. you know, as a I'm primarily a clinical psychiatrist in my practice and you know for 40 years and I was impressed at the end of those 40 years every new patient was like you know I've never really seen someone just like you before we are so unique in our biology our personality everybody's different so some people can mm-hmm. probably tolerate a lot of MD maybe maybe several times as much as another person I don't think it's possible I don't know of research about this. I don't think it's possible to predict, okay, for everybody, here's a line. Below this, you're fine. Above that, you're not fine. Yeah. It's an individual thing, yeah. and it probably changes with people from year to year, or month to month, you know, because we're, we're changing all the time. So right. there's right. no hard and fast rule. Right, got yeah. it. Yeah, I hear in, the, in underground that some people say, you know, once every three to six months max is sort of numbers I've heard put yeah, out there. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that ballpark, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the so three or four times a year for a normal person, yeah. I don't, if, it's, if, yeah. if it actually is MDMA and not other stuff. Yes. Because on the street, Test, you don't know. Right. Warning to the people, you know. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah. it's, it's, 100%. it's hit a lot with lots of other things that are not good. I think I knew someone who took MDMA and it turns out he, uh, it's like he. It was like probably fentanyl because he just like yeah. sedated and, and stopping breathing and, and he thought it was MDMA, but like there's probably fentanyl in there. Yeah, yeah. The the fentanyl crisis. So makes street drugs. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Wild. You know, I saw in, in our little, you know, a little card in our little you know packet we got uh, a new service where you can have the, not only the identity but the dose of your sample checked by a company. That's right. Yeah. So that was like you. you I know, saw I've, that. Yeah. That's yeah, right. I've heard yeah, it checked. Like you can say, well, does this have LSD or meth or opiates or whatever? But this is like the dose. I mean, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They, they still, it was a booth at the conference here. Psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, and even THC dosage testing. Yeah. Just crazy. Very cool. So, yeah. So that's cool. more. You know, more information is always good in my view. Yeah. Yeah. More 100%. real information. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Verified information. Yeah. When it comes to the research, uh, some people have spoken about the potential for research into psychotic disorders, things like schizophrenia, right. bipolar. Um, mm-hmm. Islet, Islet Waldman, Waldman right? author of How Do you, uh, A mi- Really Good Day. A microdosing, um, yeah. Yeah, microdosed LSD for uh, bipolar mm-hmm. uh, condition uh, uh, symptoms, which is mm-hmm. very interesting. All yes, on absolutely. Um, what are your thoughts on the research into those? Into, into which microdosing uh, or uh, macrodosing for, or perhaps microdosing for, say, things like schizophrenia, um, psychotic conditions. Yeah, you know, I was contacted by a researcher, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, 
where we're funding uh, the cocaine for psilocybin trial with Peter, Dr. Peter Hendricks. Psilocybin for cocaine? Psilocybin for cocaine okay. addiction. He's having, <laughs> it's taken a long time, he's having great results. But so a colleague of his there wanted to study psilocybin for schizophrenia. And so she was referring to Stan Groff's early writings, you know, Czechoslovakia, and actually had the privilege of, of, of introducing Stan to Franz Vollenweider, this major at the University of Zurich Hospital in Switzerland, who was one of our early researchers and is on our board of directors still. Mm. And uh, and because in, in all the science, like, you know, psychedelics are not good for psychotic people who are already delusional and, and confused, et cetera. And, uh, but Stan would say, when we met with Franz, he'd say, schizophrenia, that's like the best thing, one of the great things for LSD treatment. And Franz and I were just like jaw dropped. <laughs> so I thought about that since then. And, you know, psychiatric diagnoses, they're just phenomenological and the diagnostic system has changed over the years. So I'm guessing in the 50s when Stan was doing his stuff, people with PTSD can have flashbacks. They're, they're in another reality. They're, you know, quote, right. hallucinating. Right. They're delusional thing. I'm in Vietnam, you know, kill, you know, right. and there, I've had, I've worked in the prison system and there were people who were there who were high on something and got paranoid or just PTSD flashback right. and killed someone and went to prison. Right. Yeah. Really tragic. Yeah. So, but this woman said, you know, there's schizophrenia. It's, it's very complex. There's the, the psychotic symptoms, but there's negative symptoms like cognition and just flattening and lack of sociality, uh, sociability. Right. So we had a conversation, and I, and I told her the whole thing. So my sense is that what we now call PTSD, when PTSD really didn't exist as a diagnosis until mm, like after World War II and right. really was for fun, you know, shell shock. So it's just, oh, you're having a hallucinator delusion, you have schizophrenia. You know, it's just, right. but that's, that's the state of the knowledge at that time. So my, I know Stan is here, I saw him, he's like 92 almost. Yeah. And uh, I mean, not to put anything on him, you know, that's the world he lived in. But yeah. that's the best explanation that doesn't make me crazy about why <laughs> someone would recommend that. Right. But, but that being said, uh, Very low doses of LSD and, 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 and related compounds can improve cognition, attentional focus, uh, neuroplasticity. Yeah, but but just subjective. You know, think more clearly, and apart, it's called negative symptoms. Apart from the positive symptoms like right. hallucinations and delusions. So. There's evidence that that effect at low doses could be helpful for someone with cognitive distortions from psychosis or whatever. So uh, mm. if that research starts, uh, uh, start slow, start low and slow, yeah. you know, kind of a, that applies. Right. So, right. And, uh, and same for people with uh, manic episodes, you know, there's bipolar disorder, but some people only get down. Yeah. Not yeah. so much a problem, but some people get they manic delusion, they spend all their money, and they're just, they're very delusional. Like, yeah. So that's more risky. But I think, right. I've heard, I think University of California, San Francisco is looking at uh, psilocybin, I think, as a treatment for bipolar depression. But, you know, being very careful uh. and, and screening your patients very carefully and forming them because, you know, safety first. I mean, the worst thing can happen is a patient is harmed yeah. in a research study. Very bad. You just do everything you can to prevent that, which MAPS has done with their research yeah. and it's worked really well. And so, but, you right. know, schizophrenia is peep with all the drugs and treatments. There's a lot of schizophrenic people who just don't have productive lives and yeah. have to live in sheltered housing and stuff. And it's just, you know, if you're a parent, you just, you've lost your child. Yeah. You know, it's a horrible tragedy. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. They, so many mental illnesses just don't have effective treatments now. And I think psychedelics, we don't know what they can do or who, you know, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And with all these conditions, PTSD, 
uh, suicidality, depression, alcohol use disorder. You know, who doesn't know someone who's had these conditions? Absolutely. And, Have, everybody you know, knows people like that. Yeah, yeah. I actually knew someone, uh, someone I was close with at the university. She had schizophrenia. Okay. And so I got to see, like, the direct experience of what it's like for someone to live like that. Man, if any of this could help people like that, you if know. If anything, or, or maybe a yeah. new molecule will be discovered, you know, related right. to MDMA or psychedelics that is not risky for those people. I mean, yeah. new molecules, <laughs> there's plenty of them. Sky's the limit. <laughs> we we don't yeah. and yet to <laughs> be invented reasons. or imagined before. And Dave, you know, worked a lot on this and, and uh, Brian Roth at uh, Dr. Brian Roth at University of North Carolina, you know, he's sort of focusing on that a lot, you know. Some some on schizophrenia or on no, on just new molecules. Oh, okay. and some and some may not be psychoactive at all, right? But still activate that receptor, but just not in a way that gives right. you a trip. But they could still yeah, maybe offer right, therapeutic yeah. benefits. And yeah, you know, in our community, we all think the shift in perception, experience, and orientation to the world is fantabulous. You know, fat, <laughs> fabulous with psychedelics. <laughs> yeah, uh, but there's a lot of people who don't want that or yeah they're just too fragile and they just need something to feel better and so a non psychoactive could help those people suffering a lot yeah even if they don't have the mystical experience right. and and you know many of these conditions have just strictly physical symptoms too like yeah. depression so yeah. you know the more just like you know, um, physiological medicines could help with those physiological conditions. Yeah, depression, you can have just low physical energy, you know, and, and fatigue yeah. and, and exaggerated pain response. And those are purely biological things. It's not yeah. your attitude. Right. Yeah. But, and who knows how to help that? Yeah. Well, yeah. and they say MDMA is an energy booster in the underground <laughs> and microdosing, you know. So yeah. Oh, yeah. I have it. I, I you know. don't think I've really heard of it. MDMA microdosing, where I just I don't. Oh, did have, I say did I say MDMA? I meant to did. say LSD. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah LSD yeah. microdosing. Yeah. energy. Yeah, yeah. no, there's a lot of subjective reports that say they microdosed and these improvement. I've talked to people. I had depression and so I started microdosing LSD or, or psilocybin and yeah. Uh, yeah, those are reports and the microdosing research. You know, it's been published where they actually gave the LSD to the person, not like you do it on your own and you tell us what happened. Right. Uh, they only did it for like a couple of weeks and because that's the money ran out you know right and microdosing you know that's a long-term thing you need to study it for months really to get an accurate thing and what kind of patients what are their symptoms because just anybody microdosing well you can't make conclusions from just people in general like what about people with depression or yeah. ADD or whatever you know yeah that's and that's a lot of expensive research that hopefully eventually, you know, NIMH or whatever could, could let's fund those things. Let's get that going. Yeah, yeah let's get yeah. the money in. We need yeah. this. And there's, you know, an aside here, there's now pressure. There's a caucus in the House of Representatives to increase federal funding for psychedelics. And, uh, and then uh, people at the NIH, we've heard some institutes like, oh, they're already feeling, quote, you know, interest from Congress in in this, in, in funding more for psychedelics. But they have a problem because it's it's the peer review scientists from outside the NIH that review these things. And most scientists don't really know much about psychedelic research. And if they don't know, they say, well, now this is this is irrelevant or it's, you know, no one's gonna take these drugs. They're just ignorant. And so we need more researchers to be on these peer review committees who know and can say, yeah, this is good, you know, and that's that's a long time to get these young researchers experienced and on these review yeah. panels because that's that's the high bar. That's like you have to pass peer review, which is out of the control of the director of NIMH or whatever. Yeah. So that's important. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'll say, if you're watching this, please subscribe <laughs> to Maps Canada. And if you'd like to support our mission of supporting equitable and legal access to, and regulated access to psychedelic medicines in Canada, then please click that link to donate below. Thank you, George Greer. I don't know if you want to tell the camera people to donate or yes, click he the link. <laughs> Hefter.org. Hefter.org. Uh, Check it out. There's a link. You can give it by PayPal, etc. We need money. Everybody needs money. And funding is tight in the nonprofit 
uh, sphere in the last couple of years because of all the drain from all the money that's already been given, you know. The philanthropists are like poor now, you know, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> right. Oh. And, uh, and all the for-profit are getting all this investment money, it's, you know. And so uh, funding's really tight for everybody now. So it's everybody needs it, not just Hefter, you know. But yeah. we, we want to support this gap to really strategically target that to really leverage that for the whole field, federal funding, et cetera. 100%. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, George. Thank you. Amazing. All right. Amazing. All right. Amazing. All right. Subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs>